Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Reveal Report. I'm your host, George Iceman. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you being here on a Friday. We're kicking off the weekend, folks, and you're here, and we appreciate you. Remember to like, subscribe, and share. Thank you for following us on all our platforms, whether it be Twitter, Telegram, Instagram, or right here on YouTube. And of course, the amazing Patreon family. Thank you so much. Without you guys, uh, there's not much we could do. Uh, we're on Patreon. We do the after show. We have a lot of special uh, shows going on, especially our weekly news update every Monday. Um, been an interesting week working on some things that I had for this week, but it looks like we're going to be going really hard this Monday. Um, if you are interested in hearing about our intel and stuff, join us on Patreon. Uh, Kimberly Ann Goygen, aka Kim Possible, will be joining me this Monday, 8 o'clock, as we get into world politics. What's going on around the world? Things we cannot discuss, uh, but on that platform, Patreon, they'll, they give us a little bit more leeway. So join us. It's going to be quite amazing. Tonight, we get into Greek gods. I know that many people are like, Greek gods? Yes, Greek gods. Uh, what does that have to do with the occult? Many things. Nothing is what it seems to be. In fact, many names that we've heard in the past are changed through the centuries, and they keep changing. So hopefully we tap on that, give you guys a little bit of a understanding on what it is. If you're new here, we thank you for watching uh, the Reveal Report. What is it? You see some black and white pictures. You see this amazing intro video. By the way, I think it's the best one on YouTube when it comes to shows. Uh, we discuss the occult, the esoteric, the supernatural, the paranormal. We try to shine light on the darkness and give you the chance to understand what those behind closed doors are trying to do. By you not doing anything about it, you give them permission. Uh, we do not support Satan, if you're wondering. We do support God Almighty and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have to reassure those people that are watching for the one or two trolls that try to put out there, that's not what we do on this show. It's exactly what we do on this show. We shine the light on darkness and give light to the Lord God Almighty. That's our job. That's what we do. And we love doing it. Again, special thanks for all those watching the show, supporting Patreon and here on YouTube. Special shout outs to Lisa on PayPal. Thank you so much, Lisa. Much appreciated. I seen it. I appreciate it. It helps this show be on air every single Friday. So Lisa and others that contribute on Patreon, thank you and God bless you. It means a lot. All right. Without further ado, I want to bring on my co-host who is an author, uh, written several books, does many courses, and really gets into this type of conversation, the occult. Miss Jesse Zaboulder. Jesse, how are you? Hey, good, George. You know, well, every we time a, we have Gary on, I get, I, I just get so excited, right? <laughs> it, it's quite the round table and we're going to get into it. We're going to bring this guy. They just love him. They love hearing him talk. You know, Gary, I I'm going to say him talk, George. I, I know, but I'm going to say this and it might ruffle feathers. Gary, you're listening, you're backstage. Even if you didn't know what the hell you were talking about, if you just talked mumbo jumbo for an hour, I think people would tune in to listen to you talk mumbo jumbo because it's the sound of your voice. It's your tone. You do it with authority. You got that innocent face and shirt on. He just does perfectly. And we all love to listen to him. Let's give it up for Gary Wayne. Gary, welcome back. Yeah, I don't think that would happen. I have a way too many critics out there to let me just say anything. And, really? and Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't oh. see any critics for you, but that's interesting. Oh, <laughs> there's, yeah, there's... there's always going to be some critics. They just can't let you get away with it. You know, I yeah. said this on the show, guys, and I don't know if you guys will follow up on this, but I noticed, you know, becoming a, a Christian and, and learning this faith and reading the Bible several times, um, I found that the most critical people I've ever seen are the diehard Christians. They try to dissect. They try to put you down. The most critical. And I think that's wrong, in my opinion. Uh, so, and again, I'm new. So I'm learning the way. But it's not the way Jesus would have done it. You know? Uh, they're very critique on the way maybe your view is, on what you wear, on what you do. And listen, no one is perfect. We make mistakes, but we have to get back up and do better. And I think we need to stop judging one another. 
This is not about uh, whether you're Christian, whether you're Catholic, whether you're born again. It, that's not what it's about. I think we're all in here to shine light and to give glory to God, each in our own way. So let's let's pull back. Let's not be so critical of everybody. No one is perfect. And even though you that are judging and point the finger, remember, thou shall be judged yourself. So be nice, be courteous, and show love. Especially those in the chat. Gary, anything you'd like to add to that before we kick off? Oh, absolutely. I, I think you're bang on. And we're instructed in the New Testament to that we can have disagreements and debates, but we're to do it respectfully. And so I understand that there'll be different sort of opinions, but um, we have to be able to find a way to agree to disagree. And you're right. I think sometimes Christians can be the most critical and won't even accept scripture in the face of some of the things that, that they're saying. So one needs to be a little bit more humble and less judgmental and you can agree to disagree. And if you want to just talk with people or be on shows with people, with people you agree with 100%, there may not be anybody out there that you agree 100% with. So <laughs> it's about it's, it's about trying to communicate and get more information out there and to let people decide for themselves so they can make their own decisions. I love it. Jesse, would you like to add anything to that before we begin? I think, I mean, it is all about the discussion. You know, that's what I enjoy it's not fun when it, somebody has all the answers, but even with that, if the answers are not right or, you know, let me put it another way. Everything has layers and, you know, I want to know the depth of things, not just the surface layer of things. So in order to do that, you got to get into the nitty gritty and you have to be willing to dive deep. You know, you have to be willing to wrestle and struggle with what things are and especially with the Lord. You know, there's times all of us, we struggle and wrestle with the Lord, and that's how he brings us deeper, especially in the truths of his word. Very well said, guys. So sit back, relax, grab your popcorn, grab your favorite drink, your favorite snack, your tea. I'm drinking chamomile tea this evening. Gary, anything? I, I'm assuming you're just a water guy. <laughs> just water. Okay. And there is a uh, tradition in uh, some of the descendants of Hercules that we're talking about uh -huh. um, that uh, has their take some of their genealogies back to Tam Tamiel, which most people aren't familiar with, but it's another name for um, Kazadiah or Kokomel in the book of e Enoch, depending on which research you're looking at. And mm -hmm. not that the modern day chamomile tea, tea does this but in, I, I see george getting nervous gary yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, it's it, like it, no it, don't it, ruin it, my tea for me it shouldn't affect him because he's male but that was a potion <laughs> well that's a good it, thing it was a potion back then as the mythos or the, the mythology goes is that it was created to drink to t uh, to cause abortions and, <gasps> oh really yeah huh. so and uh, so anyway interesting because that's something <laughs> it's a caffeine free tea that they tell pregnant women they are safe to drink wow yeah yeah, yeah but not not before the flood it was a whole different mixture i think <laughs> you never cease to amaze me gary with these yeah. these type of things these type of tidbits i love it yep. we want to begin with the first and I think we should start off with Apollo. Apollo uh, or Apollon is one of the uh, Olympian deities in classical Greek and Roman religion. Um, part of the mythology, Apollo uh, was recognized, of course, as the sun god. Apollo, mostly known for the sun and light, representing the sun and light, okay? But he's also the god of, believe it or not, poetry, healing. Music, wait, it gets better. Plagues, knowledge, order, prophecy, beauty, architecture, and archery. This is interesting, archery. Apollo was designed to be the perfect blend of superiority, moral virtue, harmony, and a reason personified. This is what they write about this god Apollo that many people and see and, 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 and hear about, but there's a lot more to it. Let's begin maybe with you, Jesse, if you'd like. 
It's interesting that there are so many different things that we could say, but what's interesting is that this morning I actually was reading a book in scripture that I haven't read for a very long time. It's one of the minor prophets, the book of Habakkuk. And I think I want to talk a little bit more about Apollo here first, but it was interesting because it brings out the Lord's arrows and how his, you know, how he shoots those and his arrows even split and divide the land. So just kind of interesting that, you know, I think that a lot of these Greek mythologies and different virtues that were given to gods are things that have been stolen or taken or, you know, is it that, you know, they were made from fallen deities who had special strengths, powers? Um, did God allow them to have such great power that they could do these miraculous things? Or is it that, in essence, they're trying to steal God's God's virtues, um, the things that are recognizable for him alone? So it's kind of interesting. Apollo, interesting. Let's get into it, Gary. Thoughts on Apollo? Oh, a few thoughts on Apollo. <laughs> one, of, one of the more famous uh, sons of Zeus and part of the Olympian gods. Uh, son of Zeus and Let too. Um, as, uh, as the genealogy goes, god of Delphi. Um, and there is a... Uh, I guess a goddess that is also associated with Delphi, but that was sort of more before the flood. And so Apollo tends to become and inherit that after the flood. And that's the home of the prophets and the oracles and all that sort of worship that's going on there at that time. And so he's also, uh, as you mentioned, a god of the sun, most uh, representative of, the, of a sun god and also of the arts, which is also quite interesting because you have Apollo, before I get into that, maybe I'll just back up a little bit on his genealogy a little bit yes. and, his, and his name. Um, so Apollo is in the Greek lexicon that is part of the Bible where it is translated out and Strong's put into a lexicon and meanings for the words. It's in a group of words with Apollyon. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Apollyon is uh, the word for destroyer, just as Abaddon is the cognate word in the book of Hebrew. And Shiva would be in the Hindu uh, pantheon as the destroyer god. And mm -hmm. Azazel, before the flood, was... Uh, the chief god and destroyer of the antediluvian world and he brought war and he brought all sorts of arts uh, and knowledge and is the scapegoat for the antediluvian sins and as the destroyer of the world he's also the leader of the fallen angels that went to the abyss and and likely is the same as abaddon and apollyon and so you have sort of a descendancy here through Apollo that is, is, is kind of associated with Zeus as the sun, and Zeus would be the offspring sort of equivalent of Baal, but one who takes over for, let's say, Azazel, that would be below Satan, as the book of Enoch would put that hierarchy. And so the son of perdition also goes back to uh, the same root, words and uh, words where Apollo is in, but not directly to Apollo, but more to the son of perdition as an Apollyon, as it's the same series and it's just a sort of past participle of it. So, and you have a genealogy there that is, you could look at as the son of perdition as being, you know, for Antichrist, but the definition of that is kind of comes out of Judas, who's also called a son of perdition for betraying Jesus or, be, or opposing Jesus. So you get some context there uh, with it. But it's just interesting that uh, Apollo is uh, one of those gods that is sort of raised up above so many other ones of, of, the, of the Greek. And he's the, you know, Zeus is an offspring god and Apollo is an offspring of the offspring god. 
And we kind of talked about that like with Horus, uh, with the uh, e Egyptian pantheon. So there's sort of a connection there. But the, the last thing I wanted to say before I talk too long on Apollo is that he and uh, Athena, they were the goddess and god of the arts and poetry mm -hmm. and literature and things like that. And they held a, a spear. And when they wanted to influence power, they would shake that spear. And it had mm -hmm. superpowers that were sort of associated with it. So roll that forward to the late 1500s and early 1600s. And you have uh, Francis Bacon, who forms a two writing societies who are going to create the English language for the King James Version Bible to be the language of the world is what he's imagining it for, for the new Babylon or the new Atlantis that they're trying to create. And he's going to bring into the Knights of the Helmet and the Knight and the uh, Order of the Spear Shakers uh, or the Spear Shaker Society, um, young writers who are going to write plays and start to evolve this language. And Bacon is thought to have written, and in a lot of circles, thought to have written all of Shakespeare's plays. And Shakespeare is the front man mm -hmm. for him. And that's where the name Shakespeare would come from, would be the goddess and god of the arts and literature and plays and entertainment um, who had this spirit that they would shake. And so... Mm -hmm. We see their influence coming down through history and we see things done in their names to honor them because that's what polytheists do. They like to associate their worship in plain sight in ways that we don't necessarily would understand. Is that at all connected to the order of the quill that you're aware of? Yep. Okay. Yep. Same kind of society. Same would be akin to a later version, which would be the Inkling Society. Interesting. Okay. You know, a little bit more on Apollo I find interesting is, you know, Apollo never married. But apparently he inherited his father's lustful ways and had several love affairs with both men and women. He even fathered a number of children out of marriage. So this is what he inherited from his father. Some very interesting stories, even going back to the movies, where you see Zeus taking earthly women to bear children with. And they've become either half human and half gods, inheriting certain powers. It looks like Apollo did as well. Uh, it, it is, is, his stories are very interesting. Again, he represents the sun and the light. He represents... Um, archery, um, and hunting. Interesting, hunting. So it's kind of similar, if you know what I'm talking about, if we go into it, I, again, two different deities from the past. Um, it, it's just a different name. Who would you say that reminds you of, uh, Gary? Well, if you are talking about hunting, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, in... The Norse mythology, I would look at Odin mm -hmm. and, you know, and we're coming up to the season of the celebration of Odin's hunt, which starts December 20, uh, 17th through the 23rd. Uh, I would also look at Hearn. Hearn as, as uh, in uh, yeah. Hermes? Uh, no, Hearn as in the Celtic Druidic oh, pantheon, okay. which okay. would be a god that would be akin to Cernunos as well as a, as a horn god. Um, and a god of hunting and of nature, or I would also look at um, that connection back to the Etruscan pantheon for CERN. I would look at that pantheon for uh, a later pantheon there as Bacchus. I would look at Pan of the uh, Greek uh, pantheon representing that horn god, and that would also be equivalent to Azazel. Correct. As you look into the goat god, um, satyr, degraded um, watch your understanding of these horn gods. Now, some of the people in the chat were um, uh, referencing a particular movie, uh, The Immortals. Are, would you consider these Greek gods as the immortals? This is what they're referring to, or they were recognized as the immortals. 
You're talking to me? Yes, yes, you and Jesse. Yes, they would be the immortals, mm -hmm. uh, the ones who uh, never never die, the everlasting ones. There's a whole bunch of different sort of names. And so I think the, uh, you know, even the Committee of 300 makes a recognition of that, although they sort of move that into the 300 families. It's based on the 300 of the immortals uh, around uh Mount Olympus. So all of that allegory is is, is tied into that. So yeah. yes. And so that's what's so surprising about gods that die if they're immortal. That that's just not possible. And and I was hoping you were gonna go there. So so there you have it, folks. You see, the immortals weren't really immortal now, were they? Um, they were not. <laughs> now they were they were they were pictured as giants and I was able to go to Athens, Greece, and I went to the top of the mountain, uh, I guess what, Olympus, uh, was it they would refer to, um, the Acropolis, I believe it was called, and I noticed some statues, and I want to touch on this briefly because it's important, and they were massive, and I have friends that are Greek, and I said, like, you know, what was the purpose of doing these statues so big, so large, and I believe one of them said, well, it, it's... It, implying who they were, who they are. Now, does that mean they are larger than life characters? Or if somewhat of these people in some way, shape, or form existed, were they actual giants, massive human beings? Because these statues at the Acropolis I was at were absolutely massive. This thing was overlooking the, the, the ocean. I mean, it was breathtaking. And, and apparently this is the land or the place where these people dwelled in. Like I was standing in a place that's very historic. So I found that interesting looking on it. It, it takes your breath away, I will say. Thoughts on if they existed in some way, shape, or form, uh, human form that were given these names, could have they been giants? I, I For me, I think it's very plausible. Uh, we know that you know, the different governments, they have some of the, you know, the breeder programs, different projects, like the Genesis X project, where they're trying to, you know, get that DNA, they're trying to recreate, um, you know, what they call the God DNA, you even had the Liebesmord program, you know, out of Germany. So for me, I think that, I think it's probably very close to that, that, that many of them did come from lineages, um, where you had gigantic beings. I wouldn't say all, but I think a good chunk of them. Gary, you want to comment on that briefly? Sure. I, you know, I think that if we understand a fallen angel as a spirit being, that they have to take a physical form in the physical world. And so they can choose that gender, they can choose the form, and they can choose their size. So typically they would be understood as taking a size that is being represented not only in the Greek mythology for that size, but you see that similarity for uh, reliefs in Egypt and throughout the Middle East and particularly with the Anunnaki with, uh, in Sumeria. So they would be taking a giant size not only because of they want to show their superiority, but I mean, they want to be worshipped as something that is so far beyond what their worshippers could take on. So mm -hmm. you also have different heights of people that are on these reliefs. So the giants would be smaller. They'd be like mid-size in that comparative. And then the humans, not they're not quite like grasshoppers, but they don't come above the knees, right? So, or, And so you see that sort of um size being applied there and that just again is a visual of the hierarchy of the god the demigod and the mundane human there for rituals and slavery and uh work yeah it's it's quite interesting when we get into this apollo one of the most popular of these so-called greek gods these so-called immortals but one that we see often and we'll get into it, is this one, Zeus. Zeus always depicted as powerful and almighty. Who is Zeus? The god of the sky in ancient Greek mythology, the chief Greek deity. Zeus was considered the ruler, protector, and father of all gods 
and humans. Zeus is often uh, depicted as an older man, wise, with a beard, and is represented by the symbol such as, get ready, the lightning bolt and the eagle. I found that to be very interesting. Zeus. So he is the father, the leader, the creator. He's, he's you know, the one and all. And he's depicted in many movies. Uh, in fact, even um, during cartoons, back in the day, you'd see Hercules. You know, his father was Zeus. Zeus is depicted always as that figure. Um, interesting character. Let's begin with you, Jesse. Thoughts on this? I think, you know, I think as they began to try to replicate God or usurp uh, the throne of God, they had to, you know, make somebody that would fit that image of God the Father. Um, and I think we see that, you know, in Zeus is that they make him out to be kind of like the creator, the first, the all in all, the most powerful. Um, some of the things that are specific to God you know, are things that they attribute to Zeus. You know, we know that scripture talks about our God is a consuming fire and uh, talks about lightning bolts or storm clouds going before him. So those are things that I think, you know, they've taken and, and tried to uh, steal from the Lord God Almighty um, in their imagery. So it's, I mean, this, it's unbelievable the information that's out there, Jesse, in regards to Zeus. We'll, we'll, we'll tap more into it. Gary, thoughts on Zeus? Yeah, uh, you know, sky god, thunder god, similar yeah. to Baal. Um, <clears throat> he is the offspring god uh, of uh, Kronos and Rhea, parent gods before the flood. And he takes over and takes on, just as all of the offspring gods, they, they will inherit the titles of the parent gods who have gone to the pit prison and these guys will go to the pit prison for the same crimes that they create after the flood. And there's three that in the mythos overthrow the Kronos uh, parent god regime, and that's Zeus, Hades, and Poseidon. And so Zeus uh, is also going to have Hera as his wife, and she's also part of that whole mixture, I think should be included in the four that overthrow uh, the parent gods from the Greek mythology. And uh, Zeus is was originally depicted as were the parent gods as a serpent god. So we need to sort of mix that into the mix again because that's one of those standards all around uh, the world for the main gods as they were originally seraphim angels or serpent gods. And Zeus fathers a lot of the Olympian gods as well. So, I mean, he's got a whole list of them, and so including Apollo and several other ones. And he has a list of, well, he has at least two that we're made aware of in terms of Nephilim gods or heroes, and that would be Perseus and Hercules. Uh, so he's creating offspring gods and he's creating demigods. And so he has ability, and Minos is another one, as you get into some of the other mythologies. And he, has, and he takes his ability as a shapeshifter to take a wolf, um, which, is the king, which is the start of the uh, <coughs> werewolf mythology with King Lycon. And he turns all of uh, his family into, into werewolves uh, for um, you know, not listening to him, so to speak. And, and I won't go into the long story of it, but he is uh, the most dominant god that we have with records on. I mean, we, we don't know about the antediluvian gods as much because we don't have as many um, as as many records on that. But he 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 is a a significant uh, procreator of, of gods like Ares as well, and Themis, and several other ones, Demeter. Uh, he he is a prolific god that has a standing by his axe way above the other Olympian gods. He is quite the interesting god. Uh, you know, a lot of little tidbits about him. Zeus is known for being wise, fair, merciful, and prudent, but also easily angered. And did you know that Zeus led a rebellion against his father, 
and the Titans. Interesting. He led a rebellion against his father and the Titans, but they say he's merciful. I don't know. The speech doesn't make sense to me. You see how they put it out there? They did, He's merciful. He's forgiving, but he's easily angered. So he went after his dad and the Titans. I mean, <laughs> it, it perplexes me with the nonsense. They, they, they inbreed with themselves. Uh, they, 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 his wife. Well, are they inbred? I mean, that's what I was wondering about. I mean, Is it that or, you know, like if we think about the reality of it, who are these goddesses that, you know, these these uh, Greek gods are marrying? Are they fallen angels, fallen female angels? Are they maybe the witches? Uh, you know, the women that they took as wives that then they gave all these special powers and showed them all these special things. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Hmm. I kind of think that it's the world. I mean, they've corrupted the world. And now when you take a physical body within the physical world, you may be of a higher spiritual being than the normal creations in this world, but you're affected by that corruption. And I think over time, that starts to partake with them. And that's why it's so significant that Jesus could come into the same corrupted world, not be corrupted, and therefore serve, unlike any of the fallen angels, as the atonement lamb for all humanity to be saved. So I think they are prone to the things that go on into the corrupted world. And a lot of times in occult literature and things, you'll see that these beings, uh, if they get killed in, let's say, the matrix world or the physical world, you die there right? I don't think you die there. You may not be able to create another physical body that may be part of the punishment, but going to the pet prison is considered like death because you're never, you know, going to leave until the end time. And that's a very short period of time. And then you're off to the lake of fire. So it's like close to being death, but they're not going to die. They're going to burn forever in the lake of fire. So the only thing that really dies might be that physical body. And so uh, as you get into the offspring gods after the flood, they seem to me maybe a little bit more restricted again, just as the giants are. And so, you know, they're going to wear special types of clothing um, that uh, is going to help their bodies not to be, you know, corrupt or decay as quickly. Or maybe that's just the demigods that are doing as it comes down through the Greek mythology. Hmm. But uh, there's there's a, there's an effect in the world that they are not free from. Now, Gary, you know, you, I'm glad you brought that up. Clothing, okay, let's say clothing. Um, I mean, they're depicted in 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 these ways. Like, look... Zeus doesn't have much clothing on, right? Look, he's yeah. got like the bottom robe on. He, he doesn't really have much going on here. So would they have armor when they go to war? What, what would be their special power, you think? What would be? Oh, they would have many levels of, of their power. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the, but the, the things that they would be more afraid of is, is what other gods could do to them. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Other gods. Interesting enough. Let's get back to him because one of his logos represents is the lightning bolt. Now let's get into this lightning bolt because it represents him. This I, I didn't make this up. This is what the Greek mythology is. Now I was taught through the occult that the lightning bolt is, is associated with Lucifer rising and, 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 and Satan. And he is, that's that representation uh, it's also seen in many musical artists and videos and in pop culture today, but mostly associated with power and darkness. So how do we go from the king god, the immortal Zeus, with a symbol of thunderbolt to associated with darkness and power, also associated with Lucifer? It's a good discussion. I think I'd like to get both opinions from it. Let's begin with Gary. Yeah, I mean, they're storm gods, right? Just as Zeus is, is a thunder god. And so they're thought to be able to, and part of the myth, mythos of it is to, is to control forces of nature and had the ability to control lightning. And that's 
uh, not a, an unusual thing amongst the gods in in hello in, in oh he's cutting out there Gary Jesse can you hear me yep I gotcha all right let's pull him out and give him a second here to because he's completely frozen. But let's get into it for a moment here. Again, the lightning bolt. Gary, give us a second. We're, we're waiting for your reboot because you froze up. That lightning bolt is, it's even biblically, I saw Satan fall as lightning. Jesus says it in Luke. So I want to make reference to that because that's his lightning rod. That's his lightning bolt. It's the fall of Lucifer. That's what they say. And again, like I said, it's depicted in many movies, usually associated with darkness uh, and power and strength, uh, but it's not what people quite think because they see lightning. They think, "Oh, it's it, it's just it has nothing to do with it." But occultically, it has a lot to do with it. And I want to touch on that so people are aware because people like to use that in their T-shirts. They think it has no meaning, it makes no reference, but there is. Uh, the, the, on sports teams, you'll see it. You'll see it on, on TV shows. It's everywhere. It's all around us. So I want to be specific and add a little clarity to it. Let's bring back Gary and see how he's... Gary, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm not sure what happened there yet. Yeah. Everything sort of blanked out. The so. information was too good. They were trying I, to block you, but we won't have yeah. a part of that. Yeah, and I, and I was—I don't know whether I heard me talking about the weapons of the gods in terms of. You just got there. You just got okay, there. and then I'll—I'll I'll get to the to, to the lightning part as well as in yes. in Luke ten eighteen. So, you have uh, weapons that are used by the gods all over the world, and you see this, um, whether it's in the Norse mythology or the Hindu uh, Indian mythology, where this these weapons could actually destroy the world, and they're like nuclear weapons, and they can oh. shoot lightning and stuff like that. So they have that type of power as well as being able to control the forces of nature. And the association with Satan falling like lightning from heaven, he was a shining being of the most extraordinary level before he fell from heaven. And so you would see that falling with all of that light Oh, uh, hey, hey Gary. Go. Gary, yeah? quick question. Maybe let's do take off the camera and let's hear the audio. Let's see how that works. Maybe it could be yeah, freezing he, up. Let's try that. Maybe uh, uh, unlock the, the camera. Yeah, let's it's unusual. So you yeah. guys are perfectly clear. Yeah. Um, let me just do a here. I'll take the camera off and I'll let okay. you guys talk. I'm just going to do a yeah. check on mm -hmm. my upload again. No problem. There we go. While he uh, does yeah. that, Jesse, again, let's, uh, you know, we, we talk about the fall of Lucifer it represented in a lightning bolt. Uh, you see it in rock bands, ACDC. You see it in, 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 in movies. You, you see it in pop culture, uh, television, sports teams. It is everywhere. It represents power, strength. Uh, now it also represents nuclear power. You see that? Very interesting. Nuclear yeah. power. Uh, you've heard of the rods of God. Mm -hmm. um, interesting similarities here, all about this thunderbolt, all going back to the guy that represented it, Zeus. So yeah. in truth, we must ask, was Zeus an actual good God? Did he actually do something good? Or is he just another reincarnation of something else that we keep rebirthing every century or so, right. uh, and, and keep changing past gods? Well, what I'm curious about in that is, you know, we know scripture talks about um, the concept of, you know, that God gave certain governances, um, along with those responsibilities and governances, we know that they're storehouses. Um, in fact, throughout scripture, you see that he puts the star stars, the, the different lights, you know, are in charge of governing different things. And there's a connection there with the storehouses. As you get deeper into those storehouses, um, you know, we learned that not only were there storehouses built in the temple of God, but that there's heavenly storehouses and lightning bolts are one of the things that are mentioned in those storehouses that are uh, reserved for judgments. Oh. So it's interesting to think like when we think about weaponry, like we know, you know, there's a couple books, I think it's Isaiah and Jeremiah and scripture where it talks about God having an arsenal. And at one point, there's a verse where it says, you know, get ready. God's opening up his arsenal. He's about 
you know, <laughs> to basically open his arsenal against Babylon. Wow. Um, so, you know, are there, you know, did God create these fallen angels uh, to govern and have access over some of these storehouses? And is that maybe hmm. where they get some of their power and the abilities that we attribute to them? Interesting. Gary? Uh, uh, you guys blinked out on me there. So, <laughs> uh... Oh, you're cutting out again, freezing yeah. up. Yeah, Gary, if you could hear us, maybe just take off the camera and just go audio. Uh, I think he's out again, but um, we'll, we'll give him a, another second. Interesting stuff, what you mentioned. I find that fascinating uh, to bring that up. Can, he, can God use that to his advantage? I mean, listen, this is a chess game, and we're all you know pieces on the board, and the Lord uses each one of us in a certain way, including the angels and, and uh, everything it's his vision uh, mm -hmm. on what he does and how he does it. Man, I'm just, I'm, I'm so blown away by the mysticism and the, um, the knowledge, or I should say the creation of knowledge for the Greek gods. Because when you hear about it, like we went back, it, it's associated a little bit to some of the Viking gods. And then that goes back to the fallen ones. Um, it's phenomenal stuff, and we want to know more. Uh, we want to know its meaning. We want to know what it's about because, again, they, they put it in our face. It's everywhere, and the littlest yeah. thing, like a logo, like a symbol, like something, has meaning, all right? And we give it power and manifestation when we don't ask questions, when we allow them to do what they want with it. So we need to just be aware. I think that's all I want to say is we need to be aware of what they're doing and what they're doing in our face. Um, Gary? Are you back? I hope so. Uh, All right. You know, it, it's obviously the connection. My upload is extraordinary. So there's something within the internet. So uh, hopefully we don't lose the connection. I'm not sure what you guys were, were talking about there. The last time I heard, because I went out and back in a couple of times with storehouses in heaven. And I think that's such a good point. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that in polytheism, that's part of the seven heavens, as they describe it. Mm -hmm. But Biblically, we understand it as three, and, three. Those, uh, and those additional places are locations within the second heaven, um, where uh, is still within, uh, you know, just outside the firmament, I would think. It might even be within the firmament, right? Uh, but it's yeah, a location okay. uh, that God has that he draws on to bring in some of these things, mm -hmm. and that fallen angels tend to counterfeit everything. So... One presumes okay. that they may have created their own uh, storehouses of that type of power within the firmament. Wow. Or that, that they would hmm. control versus outside the firmament, I think. Incredible. Great. Interesting. Guys, let's get on to the third one for tonight. Um, our last one this evening. Very interesting. Depicted in many movies. Power, the ocean, the sea, all that jazz. Let's get into Poseidon. Poseidon, very interesting character. Uh, he is one of the 12 Olympians uh, in ancient Greek religion and mythology, presiding over the sea, storms, earthquakes, and horses. Poseidon is an ancient Greek god, um, the god of the sea, the water. Um, he is very powerful, and he carries the pitchfork, which we'll get into in a little bit. Powerful, the sea, very important. A lot, a lot's going on here. A lot of un, a lot of stuff that we could get into and dive into. So let's begin with uh, Jesse yourself. Thoughts and what you've learned about Poseidon. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to take us back to scripture. It's actually kind of funny tonight, George, that we're having this discussion, uh -huh. and I had no clue as I was reading this first this morning, but. It's interesting because it talks about, you know, I'm just going to compare here what scripture says about God in Habakkuk 3. It says that his glory covered the heavens, his praise filled the earth, his splendor was like the sunrise and rays flashed from his hands where his power was hidden. Plague went before him and pestilence behind him. He stood and shook the earth. He looked and made the na nations tremble. 
And it says, were you angry with the river's Lord? Was your wrath against the streams? Did you rage against the sea when you rode your horses and your chariots to victory? You uncovered your bow and you called for many arrows and you split the earth. Um, so it's just interesting that you have all this imagery of creation, um, you know, and so much, so much of, I guess it, we'll call it the wisdom of men, you know, where they've taken the things that are of God and they've put it into easily digestible forms um, that they that they spoon feed to people as truth. And, um, you know, in that it, it really draws people into idol worship mm -hmm. um, where they begin to worship the creation, the created things, whether that's fallen beings or nature itself. And I, you know, I think that's what we see with all of this water. Um, you know, how many, many, how many movies do we see like out of the famous, you know, Disney uh, where they pull on those different gods and make them lovable characters and make, you know, children want to be like those gods. Um, you know, they draw people very easily into the worship of those beings. And, you know, we know, you know, movies like The Little Mermaid, uh, Moana is another one, even though they focus on the female goddess in that one uh, versus Poseidon. But um, he, he was the god of the water. Uh, who ruled the seas along with Kronos and Neptune and a few others. So, yes. Gary, what do you have to say about this other god, Poseidon? Yeah, and, you know, sibling to Zeus and Hades and Hera and, you know, son of uh, Kronos and Rhea, whom he was part of the three or four that overthrew that regime. Uh, that Triton is a very powerful weapon fits into what we have before um, and is seen in, in other cultures as well. Uh, Poseidon, uh, he, he inherits as the offspring god the mythos and the authority in the realm of Iapetus, who also created giants before the flood. And Poseidon is in that sort of mythos, inheriting that part of Iapetus, where you have Atlantis being accredited to being the god of Atlantis, but I think he inherits that mythos. But in, in the mythos, uh, Poseidon creates 10 demigod kings mm. uh, through a human female, Clyto. And this is the empire of the sea, of the abyss. This is the, the 10 kings of the ancient world that's the helm of world government, or they want to, to do that by invading other nations. And they're the center of uh, culture and sort of the key to the golden age, so to speak. And this is what, you know, Francis Bacon is talking about in the New Atlantis that they want to create. And you get the Leviathan monster coming out of the sea with 10 oh, kings in the end time, right? And so it's a it's an important uh, God to understand in polytheism along with, with the allegories. And so Poseidon is, uh, is a ve 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 very, very important. And uh, he is you know, a God that is, I don't, I don't know, he, he's not like an enemy of Zeus, but he's a bit of a rival to Zeus as well, which is a very sort of odd positioning, right? Um, but still part of the co-conspirators to, to, to take over the world. So I think Poseidon is one of those key Western polytheist gods that we sort of need to understand in terms of what uh, the polytheist forces are attempting to bring about again when Poseidon walked amongst us, when Zeus walked amongst us. Uh, that's what they're trying to bring about again, just as we have those 10 kings in Daniel 2 and those 10 kings again in Daniel 7. And you have them depicted in Revelation 12, 13, and 17. I, I got to make reference to this because there, there's a lot of confusion. And I want you to understand as time goes by, folks, how they confuse all this stuff, especially with the pitchfork, right? So, I mean, if you if you go back a certain a certain time, the pitchfork 
has many different representations or how it's depicted. Um, you know, it, it's supposed to represent the three properties of water. That's what some people would say. All right. Somehow it was later uh, interpreted in Christianity as the Christian Trinity, if you can believe it. All right. The God, the Father, and the Son. That, that was in, or the Holy Spirit, I should say, is represented or what they claim to be represented. Or, you know, how these Catholics or, or, or Christian groups take everything and, and try to change it. However, I find it fascinating that after that, it's associated with the devil, with its wicked activity as a pitchfork. In fact, on Halloween, you always see the devil with the pitchfork, but it's not four or five. It's the Poseidon style one usually is what you see. Sometimes you'll see the four tips, but usually you'll see that. So you see how everything changes over time. First, it's associated. They, they, they change it all the time to make it work for themselves. To me, and maybe I'm speaking out of turn, it's all garbage. It's all propaganda. It's all lies. They keep changing the story to make it fit their own narrative. And um, again, they're claimed to be immortals, which they are not. These are all idols and idol worship. All right. In a statue, if you remember what the Lord said, well, then if you need help, go to the statue. Uh -huh. Go pray to see what, see how, how lucky you are and what it does for you. Not much. But again, they, they worship and they idolize these things. Uh, and I find it unbelievable how even in today's day and age, still there's this type of idol worship of these statues and so forth, trying to give it this power. In 10 years from now, Jesse, Gary, it'll have another meeting. Poseidon will mean, who knows? Well, it'll have another meeting, but it changes over time. So I want you both to touch on this, on the pitchfork and so forth. And of course, most importantly, it's association or comparison to Leviathan. We didn't even touch on that. The master of the water, the master of the ocean. He can cause ruckus, havoc. He has dominance. And that's similar to Leviathan. Is there any connection there? Let's begin with you, Jesse. Yeah, there's some interesting symbology with that. When you, you know, look at the kind of the outline of the um, trident there, what you end up with are two symbols. Um, like if you're just taking the outer sides, that look very much like the Hebrew Dalit and Resh upside down. And there's some very, uh, I'll say, significance in the occult with that, um, because it goes back to the Ark of the Covenant. When you see the Ark of the Covenant, you also have that, symb that same symbology going the other way with the angel's wings that um, hide the glory of the Lord or overshadow the glory of the Lord. So with the trident, it's an opposite where, you know, what do you see coming through that glory? You see what looks like a male phallic symbol. Um, so, you know, it's the uncovering of the glory and, you know, also usurping the glory of God uh, with human or manly or sexual glory. So there's some other, you know, deeper meanings within that. Um, you know, the other thing is, well, I guess I'll stop there. So I'll let Gary <laughs> chime Gary, in. Gary, give me your, your view of this pitchfork and, and what do you think in comparison to Poseidon? Yeah, I think, I think all of the uh, major gods whether they're before the flood or after the flood, they're going to take on the persona in parts of what Satan held and still holds as sitting above the council of gods, as it is described in 82. So it's like they have authority of, uh, of Satan and are given some imagery that sort of goes along with it. So, I've not really seen anything that has a an association with Satan with the Triton, although we do get that depiction in, in the modern uh, world. Um, but I presume that's sort of uh, part of it. So when you look at uh, the sky god of uh, of Zeus, that's, uh, you know, 
Satan has one of his authorities is the prince of the air. And that's sort of what I'm talking about is that that sort of gets divvied up amongst the, the pantheon who, who serve uh, Satan. And there's also an interesting sort of passage or, or, or as part of the mythology that goes back to the parent gods where you have Uranus and Gaia who are overthrown um, as, you know, by Kronos and, and, and Rhea. And it, one presumes that in that mythology, they were killed as well. Well, what's really kind of interesting about that, or maybe it's, got something to do with only one of them was killed and that Uranus is still part of the mythology and almost associated with Kronos in a lot of cases. And that in the Bible, you have Leviathan, uh, you have the female that is being slain in prehistory. And then uh, the male that will be uh, destroyed in the end time is the book of Isaiah talks about that. And we've talked about the Leviathan empire as well so i think there's a relationship there with satan and whoever his partner was in the beginning and all of that is sort of disseminated down through the pantheon in, in, in a lot of the allegories and so when we look at how satan is described uh, in the book of revelation he's a serpent and a dragon which is what a leviathan is also mm -hmm. described as and what's also interesting about whether or not it's the original parent gods, whether it is Uranus and Gaia, is that they are dragon serpentine beings in their original descriptions for the most part. And in Greek, um, you have the word Draco and Draconta, which goes back to, uh, you know, it's just kind of a, uh, a source word for dragon, but it meant uh, a serpent with wings. It also meant to watch, as in a watcher angel. Uh, and it, you just can't sort of dismiss that etymology to the connection that these were watcher rebellious angels uh, who were ruling the world, and they still do to this this very day. So, and seraphim were serpent faced six-winged dragon serpent angels, right? So I think they're part of that whole sort of rebellious kind of, of realm. So, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's those allegories that change over time, but that's because, you know, the whole, the, the complete sort of allegory was, is wrapped in who Satan was. And as he's the prince of this world, but not really governing any of the nations or anything, but they're reporting to him through the Council of the Gods, I think that sort of gets split up into those various hierarchies. Now, do you think it's possible, you know, I'm just going to kind of throw some speculations and conspiracies out there. You know, there's stories about the ancient city of Atlantis. Uh, we know, you know, the kind of the stories about the Leviathan and the raising of the Ten Kings. And you know, in those days, a, a beast rising up who's going to bring forth those 10 kings. Um, you know, what are your thoughts that, that that could maybe come from Atlantis? That, you know, there's going to be a finding and that they're going to find life on there. And out of that ocean, they're going to raise up these rulers who maybe are already have been operating under there for a long time. Well, yeah, we don't know what that relationship is. Um, and you can, you know, if you get like Daniel 243 or something, you have, uh, these 10 Kings that come from this ancient beast empire. And it could also be taken back to before the flood because nothing is new under the sun and what will, was, will be again. And are we going to see in Daniel 243, are these post-Diluvian giants? Are these anti-Diluvian giants? Are they ones that have been preserved? Uh, that are going to mix their seed with that of humans in that empire. Um, you know, the, what we do know is is that they are the branch of the terrible ones. Now, that hold, are on, gonna, hold go on ahead. a second. You just said mix the seed yeah. with humans. What do you mean by that, Gary? Well, that's what it says. It's, it doesn't give an explanation there for it, but... Uh, and you could you could also take that back to the Hebrew that 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 there's going to be a possessing or an avatar avatar sort of effect with these ten antichrist wannabe kings, um, but 
it literally says seed. So you were talking about a physical seed here. And just as we have the branch of the terrible ones that are going to be destroyed, and the terrible ones are the ones uh, who are the demigod, and some of them are in the pit prison as they're talking to the Pharaoh in Ezekiel 32. And you also have Psalms 21, 8 through 10, where God in, um, in the end time is going to uh, destroy this uh this uh, this branch or this seed from amongst the children of men. Like hmm. there's a different seed there that is going to be dealt with in the end time. So is it just the descendants or is there going to be a reemergence? I mean, we don't know, but you have to be prepared for several possibilities or all the possibilities on this. Boom. Interesting. That That's called the cliffhanger. And we stop there. Because I would like to do an entire show on this seed and this mixture in the end times and all this. This is incredible stuff. And I think we need to dive deep into this topic because I'm absolutely fascinated. <clears throat> we need to get into this. So we need to definitely do a show just on this. Gary, when are you back? I think we have you on schedule here. When are you back? Yeah, I've got, I'm back in a week or two. I'd have, okay. I don't have my ca uh, calendar in front of me. But yeah, there's another one in December. Okay, guys. So... I'm going to end it there. This hour flew by. Um, it's phenomenal stuff. Greek gods, the mythology, the folklore about it. It's never ending. We could dive so deep and there's a lot more to it. There's only so much we can discuss in an hour. But I want to talk about this seed. Most importantly, the next time you're here, which is in a week or so. And I want to get behind it. Just, just really briefly, uh, Gary, what is the, the, the overall concept to this seed that that we are going to bear some type of nephilim some these 10 uh wannabe gods or want to be kings of the world um antichrists are, are going to mate with humans yeah yeah wow. and and the cognate word wow. as we get that into the new testament are these mighty kings of the end time that goes back wow. to megas and megastanes and all go back to of great size we just don't have the hebrew version of it i cover that sort of transition off in the new book as well so there you go folks we get into it on the next show hope you join us guys thank you for watching jesse as we shut it down and move over to Patreon for the after show, which you can be a part of and be part of a round table. If you got a question for Jesse, myself, or Gary, you could um, ask away. I don't know if we're always going to answer every single question. We do a pretty good job by, by actually, right. most of them actually. Uh, I would love for you guys to join. Uh, tell us how people could support your ministry, Jesse, and, uh, and uh, stay in touch. Absolutely. Uh, you can follow me on Patreon. And then my two main websites are kingdomlivingwithjesse.com and illuminatethedarkness.com. With Illuminate the Darkness, we try to help support uh, champions, veterans, and survivors who uh, have been whistleblowers and need help um, paying their rent, their bills, uh, different things like that. So I encourage you to check out those websites. Excellent. And Gary, how do people support you and, and, and follow you about for more information? Yeah, for following me, look for me on Facebook and on Twitter. I'm starting to do a little bit more on Twitter now. Ooh. And um, if you want to get a hold of me or support me, do that through my website, the Genesis 6 Conspiracy.com. That's the number 6 Conspiracy.com. Uh, I do not accept uh, donations, but I do accept purchases of the books, so and book one and book two. So if you want to support me, that's how you support me. Uh, and book two is up for pre sale right now. I was having a conversation with the uh, publisher last week late last week and it's out of the publishing queue it's actually at the printer right now so it's going to beat the uh, release date of march 12th and i think by a fairly large uh time frame i'm i'm expecting probably late december early january but i'm an optimist so we'll have to see what happens but it's going to be sooner than later and they'll release the uh, Kindle version at the same time of the printing or very, very close to that. So people could pre-order for that. So you can pre-order off my website and I have a generous excerpt of all 84 chapters on book two and all 98 of the first one on the website. So you can get a look at the table of contents and get a good feel for the book. You can also pre-book the new book on amazon.com, 
uh, Amazon.ca and on BarnesandNoble.com. Um, and if you wanted to, after you've read the excerpts, you can buy it for me on a pre-booking or you can link over to them from the same site because I give you the links over to Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. So lots of ways to, to get or the easiest way to get a hold of the book and support me is go through the website. Support Gary guys, get that book, follow Jesse's ministry. And um, we appreciate you sharing this information far and wide. If you'd like to support the reveal report, you like our guests, you like our topics, you appreciate what we're trying to do every Friday. Please go to paypal.me forward slash George Iceman. The link is in the description. Everything helps. It goes such a long way. I, I got to say guys, honestly, it, it really does go a long way. Again, thank you to Lisa. Lisa, a great supporter of the Reveal Report every single week. Thank you thank so much to Lisa uh, for the uh, PayPal. And, of course, everyone else on PayPal that supports. It means the world. It goes such a long way to keep me here on YouTube. And, of course, guys, uh, we're on Patreon. That's another way to support me. Uh, great interviews, great guests, uh, a lot of great content. We appreciate all the love and support. Remember to get outside, get some fresh air, get some vitamin D. But most importantly, guys, this is what the topic of conversation is. We talk about Greek gods. What we're seeing is there is no gods. All right? There is no gods. There is no immortals. There is no idols to follow except the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For if you believe in him, all things are possible. So give glory to God Almighty. There is only one. He is not in a statue. He is not in a house or building made of brick and mortar. He is in your heart. He is in your mind. He is in your body. He is in your soul. He's all around you. All you need to do is reach out and ask for his help. I thank you guys all for watching. I hope you have a great evening. And remember to join us on Patreon coming up next. Thank you for watching. God bless everyone. Good night.